Greetings from the Dark Continent, Conscious Caracal here or Adams Van Sale. And tonight we're going to be shining a light on specifically the continent as a whole. And yet joining me tonight is a friend of the show, someone that's been on the on the program quite a bit. Uh, Colonel Chris Wyatt, he's retired now, but he still has all the wealth, uh, the wealth of knowledge that he that he gained from his uh, his experience in Africa and dealing with African affairs. So uh, we're going to be delving a bit deeper into the the politics on the the continent at the moment and uh, what you can expect of uh, going forward. So welcome on the show or back on the show, Chris. Well, Ernst, uh, bye bye, Donkey. It's a pleasure to be back. It's uh, it's been a while. You've been busy. I've been busy. Um, and and I was busy even before being harassed by uh, certain tech censors who ate up a lot of my time the past few months. But two things very quickly. You say you're in the dark continent, but I have to inform you it's only owing to ESCOM why you're in the dark continent. So that's the first thing. Second, thing, stage six load shedding, which they deny. And uh, the second thing is people keep calling me retired. I'm retired from active service, but I'm working 12, 16 hours a day, seven days a week. So hardly retired, but I just want to get that up on the table. Uh, yeah, lots to talk about across the continent of Africa today, and I actually look forward to our conversation because it's been a while since anybody's wanted to talk to me about Africa. I've been, I you know, I appear regularly on Ronaldo Ho's program every week now, in which we we talk about uh, Africa, but really it's focused mostly on South Africa and and uh, and a bit on the U.S. So I, I'm looking forward to this conversation to talk about a lot of events unfolding across the continent. Mm, excellent. So let's start off maybe with one of the big stories from this year, a story that seems to be shrouded in mystery. Uh, there seems to be a lot of in, uh, conflicting information or even an information gap in some regards to this specific country, and that country is Mozambique. Mm -hmm. Now, I've tried to find someone that I can talk to to give me more information, but that seems to be a, a hard task uh, in and of itself. So, Chris, is there any any idea that you can give us in regards to what happened this year in Mozambique and what's currently going on there? Sure. Actually, um, I, I've been warning people about the situation in Mozambique for over a decade uh, that this was going to metastasize and eventually lead to events like this. It was just a matter of time. And it's largely a consequence of the uh, Mozambican government not having any genuine governance presence in the northern third of Mozambique. And arguably, even in the center, it's it's not even that particularly strong. Most of their effectiveness is centered around Maputo and not far beyond that. They don't have the ability to project their governance and power, or they choose not to, a combination of the two. And this is not just the, the Frelimo government. This is during the Portuguese era. The Portuguese really didn't do much up there either. So it's a region that's long been neglected. In 2017, an insurgency began, and they began attacking people and killing people. But the numbers were relatively small, and it was ignored. And around that time frame, a little bit before that, there were discoveries of large uh, natural gas deposits under the ocean floor just off the coast in the Straits of Mozambique. So the government, seeing dollars, <laughs> yeah, got all excited about the potential for money and I'm guessing also for pilfering some of that, uh, worked with um, energy companies like ExxonMobil and others to uh, exploit those reserves. They, they gave them um, licenses to do it. And then there wound up being a liquefied natural gas project that came on shore just south of the town of Palma in the northeastern part of Mozambique. Well, over the past four years, instead of it dealing with, with the legitimate grievances that people in the north have and also cutting off this uh, nascent insurgency before it got anywhere, the government largely neglected it. And what forces they had in the north, police and military, were clustered around protecting the um, this uh, Total site, which is a French power, um, you know, French energy giant that had a site for li liquefied natural gas south of Palma. So in late 2020, the number of people being killed by these folks who uh, are being called ISIS, or but they're not ISIS. They're being called that because they claim they're ISIS. Uh, to me, this is just a cynical ploy to get attention and make an affiliation that largely does not exist. This really isn't an Islamist insurgency, which is what is claimed. Uh, Muslims don't don't butcher people and and chop their body parts up and drink alcohol and are gleeful over it. But that's what was unfolding in Palma on the 24th of March. So we get to this year and the region is still neglect. What happens is that um, that about 100 or so, that's the most accurate information we can get of these thugs, as I'll call them, uh, came with weapons and attacked the town of Palma. And a large number of people were endangered. People fled for their lives any way they could get away. But what these guys did is they circled a couple of the of the different um, lodges and hotels up there. The Amarula Lodge was surrounded. 
and then they were pretty much trapped. And so people tried to get out, expatriates and Mozambicans, and they couldn't get out. So what happened is that the Dyke Advisory Group, which is a South African security firm, or some people would call them mercenaries, they were involved, hired by the government. The government didn't fly any helicopters up there. The government didn't use its eight or 900 troops that were located at the natural gas facility to advance on Palma, even though they outnumbered these forces by eight or nine to one, at least. They didn't do that. So the Dyke Group was the only one, for the most part, who intervened. They had a single helicopter. They didn't have an offshore ship to refuel or a nearby location, so they had to fly a couple hundred kilometers south to refuel, so they could only make limited attempts. They evacuated a number of people from there, about 20 or so, including the manager of the lodge. The rest of them were left to their own devices, including majority of the expatriates. Now, contrary to Amnesty International's disgusting and vile, inaccurate report and Al Jazeera's reporting of that report, uh, this was this was just, it was put out as a racist action that the Dyke Group only took whites out. Actually, there were 20 white expatriates at that Amarula Lodge who were hunkered down there under threat of you know being butchered and murdered by these ghouls, and only six of them were evacuated. The other 14 were left to their own, and amongst them included the South African who was killed in a hail of bullets as they tried to lead a convoy of Mozambicans and expatriates to safety on the beaches so they could be evacuated. Uh, by boat to nearby islands. The majority of people who were picked up were black Africans that were evacuated from, from that uh, place with the helicopter. The helicopter was a small bird. It could only handle so many passengers, so much weight. Uh, and there was criticism that they value the life of whites more than blacks, but it doesn't hold up to the scrutiny of the facts. And Amnesty International has not said anything since I exposed their fraud. Uh, I don't know if anyone's paid attention to it, but it's disgraceful. Instead of dealing with the insurgency, people try to turn this into a race issue when it was anything but that. This is a failure on the part of the government of Mozambique, the Southern African Development Committee, and the world at large. And that's kind of where we're at now. These guys were hacking body bodies. I mean, dead, they beheaded them. They're hacking. It's, it is, I saw videos. It was unbelievably gruesome. And it's just there's other purported reports, which I've, I've never been able to verify of a group of expatriate bikers who were in a in a bar and it was burned apart. I've seen the footage of the of the corpses from that after the fact. What I can verify is I saw that that the people who tried to escape out the door who were shot as the place burned down did have uh, some sort of body armor on because I could see the body armor burned to their torsos. This, this is this is this is wholly unnecessary. It's a consequence of malgovernance or a lack of governance, and this is what you get in the end. And this has less to do with Islamic insurgency and a lot more to do with thugs who are getting away with things because there's no one to oppose them. Mm. And uh, Chris, do you know of any uh, any foreign powers that are involved here? Are these uh, are these different groups being armed, or are they uh, foreign powers they uh, fighting them? What's the, the current situation in regards to outsider influence and the uh, outsider meddling in this uh, in this situation that you know of? I'm not aware of any outsiders, including ISIS or, or, or the Islamic State or anyone else that has any interaction or is having any impact there. There is a possibility that some of these clowns that are involved in this may actually be from Tanzania just across the border because it, it's in that region. That's a possibility, but we simply don't know. Um, without the government taking action to go after and capture some of these people to identify them, we're really going to have a hard time with this. But again, this didn't crop up on March 24th. This has been going on since 2017, and it's been ignored and neglected. While these people were, were left to their own devices, before the attack on the 24th of March in Palma, which was brazen, before that attack, there were already half a million Mozambicans displaced internally because of fear of these, this small group that's doing this. Uh, a lot of it is an effort to attribute it to Islamic uh, jihadis, but it's not that. Now, there may be some people who are Muslims in the group and they're faithful. Maybe they're all Muslims, but this is not a jihad. This this is gangsterism that's being painted as something else uh, to suit political objectives and needs. There is, to my knowledge, no external influence or action involved whatsoever there. Hmm. And uh, Chris, maybe to speculate a little, where do you see the situation going in the future? If you're just looking at the the factors involved, and you're looking at the the timeline so far, what do you what do you see in the future for Mozambique? 
Sure, I'll address it. But let me get sideline her opinion. She's had a question about why the world's so silent about these atrocities. Hmm. Well, the world's silent about these atrocities because the world just doesn't care. And right now, the political elites around the world are engaged in an effort to rewrite and redesign the entire global political system and change 400 years of history uh, in an instant using the convenient excuse of uh, something that's been going on for the past 18 months. So they're not interested in this because it doesn't further their narrative. It doesn't help them achieve their goals. And so they'll ignore it. Six million people at least are dead in the Congo. Nobody bats an eye. Nobody. Nothing. So, okay, so where do I see it going? Um, <laughs> well, the Southern African Development Community jumped in and said, we're going to form a task force and we're going to go there. And we're going to, well, okay. Um, all of Africa and each of the regional economic communities is supposed to have a standby force as part of the African Union's standby force. Each have a brigade. SADC has a brigade on paper. They've trained together multiple times on occasions. We even sent U.S. Marines to South Africa to train with them on one of the exercises a couple of years ago in a historic uh, first deployment, about 800 South uh, U.S. Marines, which which was going to be a lot higher. But some members of the NC are like, what? A thousand? We can't have that. No. So it wound up being about 800 U.S. Marines went there and did an exercise uh, in the Northern Cape for part of SADC. But anyway, um, they talked about this. The president of Mozambique is reticent to have an external power get involved. I can only speculate as to what his issue is because um, if he continues to ignore this, then the entire northern region is going to go up in flames. There will be people who will come to the standard. See, that's a, nobody, you, you don't, are you hearing stories of Mozambicans and Muslims rallying to join us of this organization growing? No, because they're interlopers. They're not, it's, it's not a true sort of situation. But what I foresee is that the situation is going to drag on like this and be slow burn. Occasionally, there'll be horrific attacks. Uh, innocent people will suffer. Expats will be gone. They'll not be there. The liquefied natural gas project will likely continue or it'll just shut down. It's hard to say. Total has pulled their people out, but they don't need much in the way of force to protect that. So I think at some point, they, they'll have smart people devise and go, look, if you want to make money there, <laughs> we can secure this place with you know a few hundred security guards with automatic weapons and some drones, and you'll never be threatened. Uh, that's my analysis. I, I suspect that at some point they might do that, but right now they they just don't want to be tarred with this whole situation they pulled back. SADC said they're going to deploy a force, 2,900 troops. That was in the immediate aftermath of this, a week after it happened in late March. They have met on three separate occasions and they met this past week and they've still yet to agree on a force or who's providing troops and resources, who's going to fund it, where it's going to go, what its mission is. So as I predicted, when they said they're going to send a force back in March, don't hold your breath. SADC is not going to send anything. They will deploy an occasion, but only when it's in South Africa's deep interest, like Comoros or Lesotho for Operation Bolias twice in the 1990s. If it's not in the ANC's interest, they're not going to do it. And right now, Cabo Delgado is having no impact on South Africa, despite a lot of South Africans going, oh, jihadists are coming to South Africa. Here's a little news for you. Jihadists are in South Africa. They're using South Africa's financial networks to facilitate their terrorism around the world. They've been doing that for 25, 30 years. Huh, surprised to hear that? It's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that makes perfect sense to me, Chris. Um, it's not the first time I've heard uh, that angle on the situation. Um, but... Now, if we're looking at, for example, I mean, that's a very good summary of uh, the situation in Mozambique. Um, but maybe just uh, seeing as we're on the topic of uh, radical Islamist movements, uh, that's something that you see more up in, into the, the north of Africa. And you just said um, this is these aren't the characteristics that you're seeing in Mozambique specifically. But let's focus. Let's move sure. the focus then to actual radical Islamist movements up there, uh, more northwards uh, on the continent. So what's going on there? Is there anything significant that you've picked up in regards to uh, these types of terrorist organizations uh, and their movements? Well, we, we got to uh, kind of paint a tableau a little bit about the whole situation. And we should start, I think, not with Somalia, but rather because Somalia is not a consequence of Islam. It's or jihadists. It's a consequence of malgovernance or the lack of governance, once again. And the same sort of situation in the Sahel, that's that band that's um, below the Sahara Desert that runs all the way across from Mauritania to, to Sudan on the other side and incorporates many countries. But when we think of the Sahel, we normally think of that, that grassland, scrubland, uh, semi-desert. And we usually, what, what comes to our mind is Mali, Burkina Faso, northern Nigeria, Niger, and Chad. That, I mean, that's not the entirety of it, but that's what comes to people's minds. 
What's happening is that um, there's always been lawlessness in that region. There's always been smugglers, human traffickers, tobacco smugglers, alcohol smugglers, uh, people taking advantage of ancient caravan routes that they're aware of, except using vehicles now with petrol in them. And uh, that's been happening a long time. In addition to smuggling arms, that's that's been there. That's always been there. And that will be there because the nature of the train, it's like a sea. You can't control all of it. You can't patrol all of it. And so people will move through it at will. And they always have, and they will. Now, as far as Islamic insurgents, yeah, there are Islamists. There are jihadists in the region. And they moved into a region in which they saw an opportunity. So you wind up having early on a group called uh, Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb. They moved into the region. They attacked oil facilities in southern Algeria. Horrific acts there. They wound up in Mali. Eventually, um, the... They attacked Mali, and one reason that the uh, the coup happened back in was it 2013 or 2011 the first time, uh, the recent one. The reason that one of the reasons the coup happened is that the the government of Mali in and in, in, not in Bangi in um, Bamako I'm confusing countries here in Bamako sent the army north to defend the country, but they sent them up there. Half the soldiers had no weapons. Those who had weapons, half of them had no ammunition. They had very few vehicles and fuel, no water resources, water buffaloes to take water around, no, no rations. They were expected to live off the land. And when they got to the north, they faced a serious foe in AQIM, Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb, which is affiliated with Al-Qaeda and actually is far more powerful and influential than the original Al-Qaeda currently is and has been for several years. AQIM, when they arrived in Timbuktu, a lot of people forget this. I remember vividly watching on screens and seeing still photographs. They had that gorgeous, beautiful, expensive, highly effective body armor, the stuff that as an active serving U.S. Army officer, I can only dream of having because we had crappy stuff. Uh, but they had this amazing body armor and it was black. And on the front stenciled in English, it said Islamic police of Timbuktu. Now picture this. This is the day they arrive in Timbuktu. So this is, you know, this takes planning. It's not like they just, you know, walked into a store. Hey, where's the body armor for the Islamic police of Timbuktu? No, they had this stuff done ahead of time. And on back, it was in Arabic. And it said Islamic police of Timbuktu. Now, that's what the French in Operation Barkhan and Serval intervened there. But the army overthrew the government three weeks before a national election to get a new president because this is one of the reasons. They were sent to their deaths, essentially, facing this. So there are legitimate groups. AQIM actually attacked Mauritania with the goal of overthrowing the government there. They fought a pitched battle in, in the eastern part of Mauritania. Both sides took pretty horrific losses. The U.S. government moved in at the request of the Mauritanians, trained their logistics units, equipped their logistics units, and helped them with advice. The next time they met in combat, the Mauritanians held their own, defended the borders, and schwacked AQIM, pushing them back into Mali and Algeria. In Niger, they're also active there. And this is just one group. There are many of these other groups out there. Uh, from my perspective, very little of it has to do, same with terrorism, very little of it has to do anything to do with, with religion. That's an excuse used by people to get people to rally to their standard or to their flag. Uh, most of these people don't see a conflict between uh, Islam and no other faiths or no faiths or Christianity. It's a convenient excuse used to incense, to get people to do things they wouldn't otherwise do. Now, in Nigeria, and then I'll stop so you can ask a question if you want, but in Nigeria, we have another group called Boko Haram, of course. Boko Haram started as a movement that was angry because the northern part of Nigeria was being neglected by the government. The resources from the, the oil-rich state weren't reaching in sufficient numbers in their view, and they had a, a legitimate grievance. Well, the government overreacted arrested the leader and founder of Boko Haram, um, who was largely peaceful, and uh, several hundred of his followers. And he died in government custody, along with a bunch of his followers. So when that happened, Boko Haram became a militant group and started um, protesting. They attacked police stations. The police ran away. So they broke in and stole all the firearms from the police station. And suddenly they have weapons. And it's gone on from there and there. When they, the Nigerians sent the 6th Division in the north to fight them in the northeastern part of, um, of Nigeria, near the forest up there, the Sembizi Forest, the uh, Boko Haram fighters of the stage had been around for several years. They, they, they attacked the 6th Division and they ran away. Soldiers literally dropped their rifles on the ground and so they were better armed. So just recently, um, the leader of Boko Haram, which is splintered and split into other factions, plus there's other jihadist groups there. There's as much discord amongst the jihadists in Nigeria as there is in their fight against the Nigerian government now, which has actually made things a little bit calmer in some respects. But uh, Abu, ba Abu Bakar Shakao was claimed to have been killed in an attack by a rival Islamist group, ISWAP, the Islamic State in West Africa province, against his Boko Haram group. And when they did that, um, 
apparently he committed suicide. He blew himself up with a grenade or an explosive or a, a, a body explosive. So it's been reported for a couple weeks now that he's dead. Today, there was a report out from that group, the Islamic State of West Africa province, that uh, in fact, he committed suicide and he's dead. So it's, it's really complicated, but I would argue, um, which is not what many counterterrorism experts will tell you, but I would argue that much of this has little to do with Islam. It has a lot to do with power and control and who wants to control things. They're using something at their disposal that they think is effective. Some people are legitimately doing it for that reason, but the, the real people behind it are actually egotistical, greedy, and arrogant. No, that's oh, fascinating, that's Chris. Uh, but in uh, regards to, uh, let's stay with Nigeria. Um, I think something that uh, really made the news headlines this week was the fact that uh, in Nigeria, the uh, Twitter was banned or Twitter was uh, taken uh, offline uh, on the in the in the entire country, and this actually had a lot of people talking. Um, so, what's going on there? Do you have any insights for us in regards to this news story? Well, it's interesting because you think that uh, I bet you Donald Trump's going, damn, I wish I had that kind of power. <laughs> if I could only ban Twitter in the United States, that would have been awesome. Uh, but uh, so what's going on here is that um, President Buhari, uh, who's a graduate of the U.S. Army War College, by the way, uh, President Buhari, but like in 1980, it was a long time ago. He um, is under attack literally from all angles. People are angry with the security situation in Nigeria. There are armed gangs attacking villages in the northwestern part of the country. 66 villagers were killed this, or no, I'm sorry, that's, yeah, 66 villagers were killed. Actually, the number's up to 83 now. It's hard to keep track of this. Uh, then you've got the, the you've got Boko Haram running rampant in the Sambesi Forest, the northeastern part of the country. You have police accused of human rights abuses shooting on demonstrators with no just cause. You have criminal activity spiking. Is It's, it's, you have the Niger Delta, which is once again up in flames and a separatist movement down there, all but starting a civil war. And so he threatened on, on Twitter, he used his Twitter account to say, look, there'll be consequences if you break the law. Twitter decided, because a lot of Nigerians took offense to that, as people are bound to do, they reported him. So Twitter took him down for 12 hours. So Nigeria said, fine, you're banned from Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> what I say is it if Trump only had that power? Wow, what would that be something? And so, uh, to their discredit, and I say discredit because um, while I, I I don't think that the solution for Nigeria is to ban Twitter and 39 million Nigerians who use Twitter from having access to their account, that's a bit draconian. At least they're taking action. These tech titans do what the hell they want with no consequences to heads of state, to heads of state. They did it to Trump, they're doing it to Buhari, and they just allow people to do what they want. Uh, you and I could both go on Twitter right now and find the most vile, repulsive, threatening, um, bullying, threatening people's lives, accusing people of things, and nothing happens to it. Nothing is done to take it down. I, I've been attacked by a bunch of flying monkeys who are friends of a particular leftist in South Africa. I'm not even on Twitter, and they, they, they type in my username and you just to draw me into their arguments because they're angry about stuff. That behavior, nothing happens to it. So Buhari sends a warning through a communications method, and they take it as, as, as um, abuse or bullying, so they remove it. So Nigeria is suspended, um, and they shut them down. Now, what's happening here in the West is that the United States, the European Union, the United Kingdom, Canada, Ireland, and the UK have all condemned Nigeria's silencing free speech. Really? I haven't seen any of those governments stand up for my channel disappearing when I violated zero of YouTube's channel uh, rules. Nobody stood up for my, my freedom of speech from a tech titan that has exemptions here in the States they shouldn't have. Hmm, what about that? Now, they're just doing it because it fits a narrative and Buhari is standing up to these tech titans who are part of the global elite because he's trying to stop conflict in Nigeria. Now, you can argue with his approach, whether it's right or wrong, and, and I would say I would have done something very different. But whatever the case is, I I, I was kind of gleeful to see that, that that Nigeria said, hey, you're going to ban our president? Hey, Fotsek, we're going to ban you. You can't be in Nigeria, man. So yeah, I'm actually, um, that's kind of what's going on. And this is playing out. I'll cover this in the news when I cover news on the Night Owls edition today, talking more about this uh, the situation in Nigeria with Twitter. It's it's, I'd say it's comical, except that I'm sure that many of the 39 million Nigerians who use Twitter are probably pissed off because they can't, uh, they can't get to their Twitter. But listen, let me tell you, if you're, if there's any Nigerians here watching, and there used to be some that watch my other program, uh, if you're here, take it as a gift. Twitter's a cancer. All you do is get incensed and pissed off by reading the garbage that's on there. So why bother with it? Just take a break for a few days. It'll all settle down and they'll apologize to Buhari and Nigeria will let them back on the network. <laughs> Uh, when I asked, uh, that, I asked okay, that, okay, there's a little bit of an echo there, Chris. I don't know where it's coming from. 
Uh, let's see. Well, maybe if I turn my mic off when you're speaking. All right. No, I think that'll work then. Um, all right. So yeah, no, it's gone now. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, well, that's that's very fasc a fascinating take in regards to uh, Nigeria's moves there when it comes to Twitter. I think <laughs> uh, it's funny that you mentioned Donald Trump in this regard because uh, it's the fact that you the the president or the the previous president of the United States is not on Twitter anymore because he's been uh, removed or suspended. Uh, while you still have terrorist organizations on the platform, you still have radical movements and uh, insurgency movement, genuine insurgency movements on the platform. Um, it's uh, it's funny to see. It's uh, definitely uh, par for the course, it seems, with these te big tech giants. Um, Chris, but talking about America, um, what's your verdict so far on the Biden administration's presence on the African continent or their, their strategy regarding it? I mean, uh, you're not a, a big fan of, uh, of Joe, definitely not. Uh, but what are you seeing in regards to his administration's moves regarding specifically Africa and what's your analysis on it? Uh, it's a fair question. And I actually addressed this uh, in the first 60 days uh, when I was interviewed on, on some other channels. And I was asked um, by Nigerian American my thoughts on the Biden administration's policy. And I said, look, to be fair, uh, they haven't been to office long enough to, to do anything. And, and Africa is not important enough to the deputy premier of the Chinese Communist Party who resides at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. That's Bo Chi uh, Biden. Uh, you know, so uh, it's not high on their radar. So what happens is that. Um, they are inheriting a, a, a series of programs that date back to the Clinton administration that still exist that cover Africa, like the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, the Millennium Challenge Corporation under under uh, George Bush, the the PEPFAR program for HIV uh, assistance in Africa under Bush, the Prosper Africa under Trump, and Power Africa under Obama. All these programs still exist. You know, one thing about bureaucracies is they don't get rid of anything. So it's going to take some time for the Biden administration, even if they care about Africa, to do something. But I don't really think that much is going to change vis-a-vis -vis U.S. policy with Africa. And honestly, I don't think that Joe Biden knows jack about Africa. He's an interloper who, you know, famously told everybody with a straight face that he, when he went to visit him in Soweto on Robben Island with a straight face. And, and I seem to be the only American who called him out and said, I'm sorry, but uh, Robben Island's 1,200 miles the other direction. It's an island in the Atlantic near the mother city of Cape Town. Soweto is a township in Johannesburg in the High Veld. Um, and, and the fact that, 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 that a guy running for president, the president of the United States, gets away with that blatant lie, because it was a mistake, he lied. People, he thinks people are too stupid. You know, he's going he's gonna to brandish his credentials. I was there. I was part of the struggle. Uh, Joe Biden testified in the Senate before committees and embarrassed himself every time he opened his mouth. George Schultz made him look like an idiotic schoolboy when George Schultz answered his questions testifying committee back in 1986 because Biden doesn't know his rectum from a hole in the ground when it comes to Africa. But uh, And so you know where I come from that where, with Biden. But the reality is this is that the U.S. government – Whoever's in office, the policies continue. They perpetuate. They keep going. Congress keeps allocating the money over and over again for Africa. There are adjustments. There are tweaks. But by and large, we just keep doing more for Africans and getting less credit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, but – there's always a lot of this, uh, a lot of speculation when it comes to uh, America's presence on the continent, and maybe, I mean, when it, it, it from military bases to military interventions to who, what countries are getting aid, which countries are getting uh, visits from uh, high-profile uh, figures. But maybe you can shine some light on that in regards to which countries are of specific interest to the U.S. specifically uh, uh, at this moment and why. Well, before I answer that, you actually sent me a question to ask, and it, it dovetails with that well. So if you allow me to answer mm -hmm. that, when that, your no, question sure, was, sure. Your, what is the U.S. interest in Africa? Uh, now, and of course, I should tell you that if you um, speak to DA Ward Counselor from Nelson Mandela Bay, uh, one Ronaldo, Jose, our interest is oil. <laughs> no, but just kidding. Uh, actually, he does say that jokingly. But uh, seriously, trade, governance, and security are ultimately the, the pillars of U.S. interest in Africa. But ultimately, no American president wants to be bothered with Africa. None of them. Uh, they, they really have little interest in Africa, and that includes Obama. You know, contrary to the, no bir the, the birthers who said he wasn't American, he's an African, and contrary to all the Americans who say he's African because he's African heritage, he's not. He was an American. 
Uh, and so American presidents don't want to be bothered with Africa because in the geostrategic um, realm of things, rarely does Africa rise to the level that it's an existential threat or even an interest of that importance to the United States. And that's just reality. You had a lot of false prophets running around in the early part of the aught decade, uh, about 15 years ago, going, oh, uh, West Africa will be critical to the U.S. and in the next decade, we'll get 25 percent of our oil from West Africa. No, we don't. We get virtually no oil from West Africa now. We used to. But because we're the world's largest energy producer with uh, shale oil and tight oil and, and fracking, uh, we produce more oil per day than Saudi Arabia, if you can believe that. The United States has essentially nearly tripled its oil production over the past decade. It's unbelievable. And we're the largest energy producer as well. Uh, when you consider everything, nuclear power, hydroelectric, solar, throw all that in there, we produce far more energy than any country in the world. So we don't need West Africa's oil. We did at a time. But the point is that um, there's little in Africa that raises up. People are like, well, what about terrorism? Um, name one terrorist group in Africa that has targeted American interests in the United States or in Africa. None. None of them. Al-Qaeda Islamic Maghreb has never targeted us. Al-Qaeda has, but Boko Haram has never targeted us. They've never said they're going to target us. Uh, Al-Shabaab has never targeted us. Uh, so, uh, you know, that isn't an existential threat to the U.S. So that's the first part. Now, the, the question you just asked there is, is which countries? Um, now, that's a fascinating one for you, uh, Ernst, because... You'd be surprised. Let me I'll, I'll put a question to you. Which country do you think currently receives the most U.S. foreign assistance in the entire continent? Just take a wild stab at it. And it's okay to be wrong because you got 54 answers. <laughs> uh, I would reckon uh, Zimbabwe. Okay, well, um, Zimbabwe has historically gotten a lot of money, despite the fact that we have sanctions on Zimbabwe. By the way, there are no sanctions on Zimbabwe. That's a lie. It's a myth perpetuated by bigots, zealots, and leftists in the ZANU PF. They are and 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 uninformed Africans who like to perpetuate lies. There are uh, no Chris, sanctions. Before you answer, uh, people in the chat are actually uh, guessing. So let me let's put their guesses on the screen before you answer. Okay. So <laughs> Brett's, Brett's been a smart Brett aleck. says South <laughs> Africa. Uh, Sideline opinion says Botswana. Jonathan okay. says Somalia. Uh, let's get uh, one more guess in here before uh, Chris reveals the answer, <laughs> which might have already been put on screen. I don't know. <laughs> I don't see it on screen. Uh, oh, so it's not there yet. Uh, all right. There doesn't seem to be any more guesses. Chris, uh, give okay. us the answer. The answer currently... At the moment, the state in Africa that has the most U.S. foreign assistance at the very moment is a state that's involved in a war. It's attacking part of its country, and that's Ethiopia, which is attacking Tigray, a province in the northern part of the country. And uh, its military has been accused of war crimes. And ironically, this is a country that that um, very much is a thorny ally of the United States. When they don't want us, they tell us to footsec. When they want us, they tell us, well, where have you been? We've been looking for you. It's a very difficult relationship. Now, that relationship improved when the current government of Abe came into power a couple of years ago, the new prime minister. Uh, but this war with Tigray is causing a lot of friction with the United States. We have 50... $50 million Millennium Challenge project that's supposed to take off, um, but it's not going anywhere because it's been suspended because of this. But right now, they get over a billion dollars a year from the U.S., a single country, billion dollars a year. And, and that's that's that surprised me when I found that out recently because historically, it's been other countries in Africa. For instance, um, just off the top of my head, these aren't exact figures, but, but Uganda gets about $450 million a year from the United States. In fact, if you took out the $380 million or so that goes to the healthcare sector, there would be virtually no healthcare in Uganda, virtually none. The U.S. foots the bill for almost all healthcare in there. And as well as Rwanda, we send money there, which subsidizes their insurance scheme. And we have leftists that don't know their bum from a hole in the ground who run around and go, well, look at Rwanda. They have socialized medicine. It's wonderful. Yeah, we're paying for the insurance, not Rwandans. So that works real well if you got a big daddy. So who's going to pay for our insurance with socialized medicine? Will China pay for our insurance? No. So, um, yeah, um, uh, South Africa gets about $350 million a year in U.S. assistance in one form or another. It's been up and down over the years as high as half a billion. Uh, but no, Botswana is not a – but actually, Botswana is a victim of his success. When I was assigned to Botswana over a decade ago, we were in the midst of lowering our assistance to Botswana because they had risen to the level of a middle-income country. So our, the U.S. government's reward to a country for success is, well done. We're not going to give you any more money. You're on your own. <laughs> All right, no, that's fascinating, Chris. I didn't know that. Um, so uh, another thing, that, uh, while we're talking about uh, well, uh, foreign aid, uh, my question in regards to to Africa specifically, when it comes to foreign intervention, is 
which foreign powers are currently or are recently moving in, uh, in, in and expanding their influence on the continent uh, from what you can see? Uh, before I answer that, sorry, Jonathan Gordon just said, I just looked up the details. Chris is correct. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Jonathan. I appreciate that. Uh, and also, I appreciate you checking me. Look, uh, before I answer Ant's, Ant's question, as I tell everybody on my channel, because I have some very devoted, sticky viewers uh, who follow me despite the repression to come over. And actually, for a channel of my size, I get a pretty good audience. I'm usually tracking with what you've got right now. And at the moment, you've got a much bigger subscriber base than I do. But um what I tell people is that don't take my word for things. Look it up. Find it on your own. Just because I say it doesn't mean it's true. And, and I, But I'm honest when I tell you it's my analysis or it's factual. And, and I was giving facts. But that was off the top of my head. Okay, so um, your question was um, – which one was it again? I'm sorry. The... Uh, my question was which countries are currently uh, expanding their – or which foreign powers are currently – major powers are currently expanding their influence or moving in on the African continent? All right. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm remembering now. I hear you clicking the mouse, but to turn my mic off, she don't get the echo, but I can just tap it too. So between the two of us, we'll sort it out. In which countries? Well, um, a lot of people don't realize this, but Turkey is deeply involved in Africa. This predates the Erdogan regime. I say regime because of their fake coup, which they use to arrest um, intellectuals and imprison them without trial. Military officers, lawyers, academics, um, business people who've been in prison for years now over a coup that they didn't participate in because it was fake. But anyway, uh, Turkey has been involved in Africa for some time, but they've really stepped up their involvement. Modern Turkish state is very busy. They are among the major players in Ethiopia with foreign direct investment, in Somalia with foreign direct investment. The Turkish Airlines was the first scheduled commercial airline flight to return to Somalia after a couple of decades of no commercial flights. And even though someone tried to blow their plane up, they still stick into that flight. Uh, and then they're all over the continent. When I ask people which country has the most diplomatic missions in Africa, naturally people go with the United States, and they're correct. But then uh, I say, who's second? They'll usually go China or Britain or France because of historical colonial legacy. But none of those are correct, although China's putting more out now. Uh, actually, it's Turkey with the second largest number of diplomatic missions across the continent. Also, Turkey has been increasing its commercial and trade officers. A lot more of them are being deployed across the continent. Why? Because Turkish industry produces consumer goods, food products. Um, they do weapon systems. They, they build F-16s in Turkey. They, they build armored vehicles. In fact, this week, Turkey sold 118, kind of like the Mamba, the South African Mamba, an armored 4x4 vehicle, a personnel carrier. They, they, they're selling 118 of them to Kenya. So the Kenyans can uh, have bought that from them directly rather than getting it from Europeans or from the Americans or the Swiss. So uh, Turkey is a big actor in, in Africa in many ways, but mostly on the commercial side, not so much on the, the when I say diplomatic from an influence perspective, they're looking for markets and they're smart. Uh, another player uh, that people spend a lot of time talking about is Russia. But from my perspective, I don't see Russia doing much other than getting involved in a few near failed states or failed states because they can get influence there quickly and they're trying to sell their arms uh, occasionally looking for access to hydrocarbons but russia has more hydrocarbons that needs to worry about so russia is not the big actor people make it out to be of course china is all over the place we know about that uh, so turkey would be the one but then beyond that there's also the emirates the emirates are actually much more involved in africa than people realize if you go back to when Gaddafi was overthrown it was jet aircraft flying from the Saudi Peninsula from the Emirates all the way to Libya and bombing Gaddafi's forces. They were engaged in that war. They were doing that. And people don't pay attention or don't realize that happened. They have also been deeply involved in building schools and clinics and resourcing the new Somali defense forces in Somalia. So they're playing a role there as well. But I don't envision the Emirates ever spreading out and having a big impact across the continent other than like a couple of airlines like Qatar and, and the Emirates airline. But beyond that, I don't see that influence increasing. Turkey's role will continue to increase, certainly economically, maybe even diplomatically. Uh, beyond that, that's really the, the major newer players that are in the continent. Uh, and it is fascinating to see Turkey spreading across the continent and their influence. Hmm. Uh, we've got a question here for you, Chris, from Brett. Brett asks, is Canada deeply involved in Africa? Uh, well, Canada is not deeply involved in Africa, but they are involved in Africa. They're involved in many places. Uh, there was a long time in Canadian history, for the better part of a century, in which Canada punched above its weight in world affairs. They were major contributors to the First and Second World War efforts. They were big contributors in the post-war success of, of building stability around the world, involved heavily in peacekeeping operations in the Balkans and even in African places like that. Um, 
I would say, though, that Canada spends more time today seeking to persecute its own citizens for crimes that do not exist, like, you know, imprisoning religious clerics over, you know, abuse or, you know, failure to adhere to an unscientific lockdown constraint. So Canada is self-absorbed with its own citizenry is trying to control them right now. So its, its actions in Africa are limited uh, and its resources there are also very limited. So it's not doing a whole lot in Africa, but it does do some work there. Mm. And yeah, in regards to that then, Chris, um, maybe a final question relating to that question in regards to uh, foreign influence on the continent. Which African countries are playing the biggest role uh, on the continent as being like a, a continental hegemon? Uh, do you have any insights there? As far as a continental hegemon, I would say that no such thing exists. Now, there are some natural states that should be a continental hegemon. And the three that come to mind immediately uh, would be Algeria and then uh, Nigeria and South Africa. But South Africa is a disaster. Sorry, Ernst, uh, your country is, is, is an utter basket case. Uh, I've, I've been a huge defender and supporter of South Africa for decades, but, but the angry, naughty children are really drug this country down to the depths. And, and, and it, it's, it's really a dark hour, I think, for South Africa. And I, I don't mean to be you know, hyperbolic, but really, uh, it's, it's, it, South Africa is punching well below its weight across the continent now because the ANC is too busy you know, playing its our turn to eat and pilfering from South Africans and, and using its legislation to chase uh, qualified South Africans white, brown, and black away from the country. So South Africa should be a regional hegemon or a global or a, a continental hegemon, but they're not. Nigeria also should be a global hegemon with 210 million people in the country, massive resources, over half a trillion dollars of gross domestic product every year, but it's not. It's not. Nigeria is a regional hegemon, as is South Africa within their regions. And they both have um, big impacts within those regions. But Nigeria is becoming more inward and withdrawn, as is South Africa, because of all the internal problems they're dealing with and the challenges they face. Uh, and we haven't even talked about the pandemic. South Africa, I mean, they, you know, you can't even vaccinate people in that country. Why not? Supposedly, the ANC said they have 40 million doses. Where the hell is it at? Sitting in somebody's freezer? Is it in a ward counselor's house in Tang? What's going on? Uh, but you can't seem to vaccinate people while the rest of the world can put the Seychelles with 100,000 people has vaccinated 80 percent of its population. The Seychelles, all those people know is lying on a beach. They're not known for their work ethic. I don't mean to in insult the Seychelles uh, because yeah. they're wonderful people. But but I mean, 80 percent of the population has been vaccinated anyway. So um then the other is Algeria, which is a hegemon in North Africa. It's a very powerful country with lots of interest, but it also has some serious internal problems at the moment. There have been riots in Algiers the past few weeks, serious riots in which a lot of damage has been caused and a lot of internal dispute. Also, Algeria has been distracted for the better part of the last 30 years by a vicious, bloody civil war that led to the deaths of at least 120,000 people in very violent fashion in the early part of the 1990s. Order was restored. Uh, but a lot of its traditional outward looking focus wasn't there. Now, Algeria has tried to restore that over the past decade, largely through its role with the African Union. Some of the key positions in, in the major departments of the African Union are run by Algerians, which is fascinating. So those are the regional hegemons. And somebody might say, what about Egypt? Well, Egypt could be a regional hegemon, or a, a continental hegemon, but its focus is mostly on the Middle East for obvious reasons. But Egypt does see itself as an African country and it is involved. So I don't see any single continental hegemons, but regional hegemons. And there's there's a couple outliers there that could also be regional hegemons and, and potentially one that could be uh, continental. Kenya should be a regional hegemon, uh, but it's not a particularly large country population-wise, um, but it does have a big role in East Africa. And Ethiopia, the second most populous country in Africa, should be a continental hegemon. But the Ethiopians are very unusual people. I don't mean to insult them or to praise them, but they have their own language. Great. Nothing wrong with that. They have their own alphabet. Okay, that's kind of different. They have their own clock. So it's not the same time in Ethiopia right now that it is in South Africa. It's not. <laughs> and not because you're in different physical areas or same time. They have a completely different clock. They tell you to come at three o'clock. That's not three o'clock you and I know. Um, and then they have their own calendar. It runs to their own tune. You know, they have Christmas. They celebrate it different than the rest of us. Even though the country's full of Christians, their Christmas day falls on a different day of the calendar year. Um, and that's not a criticism. That's just saying it's a very different world for the Ethiopians. And a lot of times they're insular. You know, we're Ethiopians. You know? it's, if you ask an Ethiopian about being black, they'll look at you like black. And even if the person's very dark complexion, we're not black. We're Ethiopian. So that's just, it's a different. So there is no continental hegemon in my view. Hmm. Uh, well, Chris, uh, you named quite a few countries and covered a lot of interesting facts there, but um, maybe uh, something that I wanted to do I've, uh, is 
when we're looking at the the continent as a continent as a whole there's many countries so it's very hard to uh, cover everything but maybe what i'm going to do is if there are any developments or security situations or um specific stories that we haven't talked about i'm going to uh use regions and then you can tell me if there's anything there that stands out that we haven't talked about so we can start with north africa is there any country or big story there that uh caught your eye that you think is important that uh, we haven't covered tonight well there, there's a couple of bad news and one good news story the, the bad news is the the riots that were taking place in algiers that's not a good it's a troubling sign for algeria hopefully that will get resolved um sometime soon uh, and then the other is is, is these um, Spanish enclaves in the north of Morocco. This is territory that belongs to Spain. They've retained, and thousands of um, migrants, all economic migrants. These are not real asylum seekers. Uh, economic migrants have flooded into there, and then were arrested, detained, and deported. And it was a very tragic human situation. A number of them drowned. You know, foolishly trying to get around the fences that are built there between Morocco and, and Spanish territory. That's a recent story as well. And then Morocco itself. Um, is, is quite an interesting player. They've expanded all across the continent, kind of like uh, Turkey has done. They started in Francophone West Africa, buying insurance businesses and banks, stakes in them, or outright buying the companies, spreading their influence. Morocco is becoming one of the big foreign direct investors in the rest of Africa, and they're African. So that's an interesting story. So that's, that's kind of the North Africa scene. Hmm. And uh, before we continue, here's a question here from the chat. Uh, Paulie says, left out Rwanda. So um, I think he's insinuating... I'm so sure hegemon or superpower or, or power on the continent. But maybe, Chris, rather than uh, uh, going into that specifically, what do you know about what's currently happening in Rwanda? Can you give us an overview? Sure. Rwanda is a, a great place to do business if you want. Oh, look, at that. You, got, you got a super chat. Cool. Mm -hmm. From Joseph Coney. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he must be hiding out in the Central African Republic. <laughs> he has his British pounding out there. But um, what do I know about that? Well, um, Rwanda is um, is mixed feelings on Rwanda. A lot of people look at objectively say that you know there's a real problem there. It's a repressive police state, and Kagame is dictatorial, and that's a fair argument to make. But the flip side of that coin is that Rwanda's clean, it's safe, uh, you can live there unmolested, and it's a very orderly society. So that's the flip side of that. What I can say is that it's a very popular destination for businesses looking to get into Africa. Right now, Rwanda just, uh, they've got a Volkswagen assembly plant that's being, I, I think it's finished now, they're actually producing cars or it's close to it. So they're going to produce Volkswagens for the domestic market in Rwanda and potentially for sale in Burundi and and and, um, and Uganda, perhaps even Kenya in the future. So that's going on. That's the first thing. Uh, the second th or the second thing. Then um, the other thing is that Rwanda, unfortunately, is a mischievous player in regional security. They're considered consistently involved in raiding or supporting activity in the Eastern Kivus, undermining security there, endangering lives. Uh, and they ironically have a tiff with um, Museveni in uh, Kagame and Museveni are old uh, traveling companions. They both uh, fought together to get Uganda's independence. And when Kagame was assembling his, his patriotic front for Rwanda, he had sucker and refuge in Uganda. He was allowed to keep his forces there to train them and live there. And then he used it as a base to invade Rwanda in 1994. So they're old friends. They've known each other for decades. But right now they're having a spat. They're having a tiff. The thing with Rwanda is um, easy to set up a business, great potential there. But it's a very small country. So it couldn't possibly be a hegemon. We're only talking 60 million people in the country. You can't be a hegemon when you know the size of your country is a place you can fly over in 20 minutes, which is what Rwanda is. So it's an important player. Uh, and it's a stable state, but uh, that doesn't mean it's trouble free. Mm. Um, so let's get to this uh, this first super chat. Uh, thank you, Joseph. <laughs> um, I don't know where you're hiding out, but uh, thank you for the super chat. So um, Mr. Coney asks, uh, what has the African continental free trade area done to change the geopolitical outlook of Africa, seeing as it's only been active since January January 1st? Interesting question, one that I addressed this morning teaching the U.S. Department of Commerce about Africa. Uh, absolutely nothing. Um, don't uh, hold your breath. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement is an agreement. Much like the Paris Climate Accord, it doesn't mean jack squat. There's, there's no penalties for breaking the rules, for creating artificial barriers or corruption. There's no, they've yet to implement protocols on intellectual property protection, on copyright protection. And until that's done and there are measures to punish transgressors, it's just a piece of paper. 
It's a nice idea. It has a lot of potential. But the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, contrary to what all the African elites are telling you right now, means jack squat. It doesn't mean anything. For instance, um, there's a, a, a two sisters in Ghana right now who've created a chocolate brand called 57 Chocolate. They picked 57 ostensibly because in 1957, Ghana became the Black Star Republic under Kwame Nkrumah. And 1957 is following. Remember, so they're trying to market that. It's very clever. So they've created their own chocolate. So instead of being like everyone else in Ghana and just trying to sell cocoa and then being subject to the commodity prices dropping and rising and life never being certain, they've decided to make move themselves up vertically the production chain by producing chocolate, selling it. And they've come up with a great brand. But what's to stop someone from Nigeria from stealing the brand, printing it on paper, making substandard chocolate, selling it to people? We all get the runs and the trots, and then we'll never eat their chocolate again because it's terrible. Well, you didn't eat their chocolate. Someone stole their intellectual property, their copyrights. There are no mechanisms to protect that. And usually when I say copyrights, people are like, oh, Disney. Who cares about Disney? That's the, China copies all their crap all the time. I'm talking about African intellectual property. What about the Finbos? When you go down to the Finbos and you find you find medicinal plants that 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 you know that the Koyan San used for thousands of years and we're just discovering that it's great for rheumatism. And so South African firm markets that, they sell it, they come up with it, they come up with a lovely logo, beautiful, gorgeous flowers from Finbos, and Finbos yeah, for rheumatism. And then somebody finds out the chemical mix and artificially reproduces it and sells it the same thing, and you're not protected. So that's part of the problem. The other problem is that states will create artificial barriers. I mean, can you just ban imports of agricultural goods from, from Uganda? Why? Well, they claim there's a problem with the goods. There's no problem with the goods. The problem is that the Kenyan producers were producing more expensively than Uganda producers, and Uganda is a threat to Kenya's economy. So they put up a barrier and blame it on something else. Botswana's just banned beef imports from South Africa because of foot and mouth disease. That's legitimate. But my point is that the African Continental Free Trade Agreement has great potential. But if you think it's going to change Africa today, tomorrow, five years from now, um, I've got some swampland in the Northern Crew I'd like to sell to you. Uh, I see uh, um, Resident Chwana uh, Woten is here. Uh, Florida man, uh, as he is now known, seeing as he's uh, residing in the, the wonderful state of Florida currently. Um, thank you very much for tuning in, Odin. I'm glad you could make the uh, make the chat with me and the the colonel over here. I uh, hope you have enjoyed the conversation so far, and uh, it has been very fascinating. Um, so, Chris, maybe to get back to that previous question, so we've uh, done North Africa now in Sub-Saharan Africa. What uh, what is a standout story for you, maybe there, or stories uh, that you think we should cover? Well, that's a big region. Would you like to focus on one specific one rather than all of Sub-Saharan yeah, Africa? Uh, yeah, uh, let's look at uh, the Southern African region. Uh, my first love. Uh, by the way, uh, Woden is, uh, is, is dead to me. Um, I haven't seen him in my new channel. I haven't heard from him uh, since he claimed he was going to New York City. I you know um, don't know what's going on there. I'm just saying. Anyway, you're dead to me. Anyway, <laughs> seriously. Uh, anyway, good to see him on the channel. I haven't seen him in ages, and I guess he's doing well in Florida. Last time we chatted, we've both been very busy. Um, so uh, in Southern Africa, Topics, obviously, Mozambique, the Cabo Delgado debacle, uh, and then just the endless every day. Um, what's the flavor of today's corruption in South Africa? <laughs> every damn day. Guede Montasha, the car power ship corruption scandal, whether it's true or not. And and I honestly, I think a lot of this is real corruption, but also some of it's behind the scenes ANC machinations trying to you know weaken your opponents as the knives come out as the ANC prepares to unseat Cyril Ramaphosa. I mean, that guy is all but having a vote of no confidence. I'm not predicting a vote of no confidence, but but he is he is not popular, and he barely got in there in the first place. And um, a little bit longer of this, and um, he's going to find himself out of office from his own party, which would be unprecedented, but it's a real possibility. I think the fact that it's unprecedented is the only reason it hasn't happened thus far, because he's proved to be an ineffective leader and ineffectual. Beyond that, in Southern Africa, um, lots of little hot things going on, but nothing major. There's still corruption going on in in, in – um, in uh, Namibia with the fish rot scandal and things like that. In Angola, the, pre the, pro the president there, Lorenzo, is trying to um, unravel all the corruption, but that, that is a gargantuan task. The Dos Santos family was basically a gangster family that ran Angola for decades. And uh, Isabel, it's ironic because Isabel Dos Santos was put in Forbes Africa and in Forbes and all, oh, she's the most successful and richest woman in Africa. Yeah. Because just like Sir Ramaphosa, everything was handed to her. She didn't. She doesn't have any business acumen. That's nonsense. And now that her assets have been frozen in Angola, and she's facing charges and potential prison time if they ever get track her down, 
um, yeah, the, the, the bloom is off that rose. Um, so Botswana, unfortunately, um, is suffering under um, what I would consider to be an egotistical, um, impetulant leader who has damaged his country's reputation and a lot of corruption is taking place there, especially in the midst of the pandemic as government officials thieve. It's ironic because his predecessor is the one that brought him into office and they started a spat the moment that Masisi became president. He started a spat with Ian Kama. And all these people for years claimed that Ian Kama was a dictator, a military general who rode with an iron fist, didn't know how good they had it in Botswana. And now a lot of people are like, how do we get rid of this guy? How do we get rid of this Masisi guy? And so that's, uh, and I could go on forever about Zimbabwe. That is the biggest joke on the planet. Unfortunately, for the 14 million Zimbabweans suffering there, it's not a very funny joke. Mm, absolutely. Uh, well, Brett's uh, really uh, sending so many super chats. Thank you very much, Brett. Uh, I hope I, uh, I hope it's worth it because I uh, YouTube only pays you if you reach a thousand rand per month. So hopefully, uh, I reach a thousand rand total this month, so I can. Uh, so your your super chat will be worth it because thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, and uh, every super chat will go towards uh, improving this channel. Uh, I'll be using it uh, for uh, whatever is necessary to maybe for a new microphone or to uh, improve the channel any way I can. Uh, so Brett here has a, not a question, but more rather a statement, Chris. Uh, Namibia is becoming more like SA every day. Now, it's a very simple uh, remark. There could be a lot of things you can read into it. Uh, what are your thoughts on, the, in, on this sentiment? I, I I hesitate to uh, agree with that statement. What I would say is that there are sufficient corruption scandals in Namibia, but what we've seen is that in the municipal elections, which is what I keep telling South Africans, I'm getting tired of South Africans trying to tell me I'm naive or I don't know what I'm talking about. They're not listening. They're not listening, and I want them to listen. It's supposed to be the 27th of October. Somebody tried to tell me the other day it was a different day, but whatever day it is in October, assuming that the municipal elections happen in South Africa, people need to go out and vote. Stop whining about things. Get off your butt and go out and vote. You can change things. Namibia proved that. Namibia proved it. Swapo is on the collapse right now. Their president is wildly unpopular. He had the lowest vote total of just 58% of the popular vote in the last election a few years ago in 2019. And if he were voted on today, he'd be lucky to get 20% of the electorate to vote for him. He is wildly unpopular. He has tried the race card. He threatened white Namibians. If you don't vote for Swapo, there'll be consequences. He actually said that. And he addressed it to white Namibians. He said, white Namibians, if you don't vote for Swapo, your life will not be pleasant. I'm paraphrasing. Um, and, and black Namibians are like, what the hell's wrong with this guy? He, he lost popularity with a lot of black Namibians because they're not racially oriented like a lot of South Africans are. And, and, and while a lot of people are easily hoodwinked by politicians, uh, and I'm not trying to give any credence to Namibians being brighter or more clever than South Africans, it seems like the effort to racialize things in Namibia falls on far more deaf ears and it finds a more willing audience in South Africa of people of all ethnicities. Um, I, I would hesitate to say that Namibia is headed on the same path uh, because the newspapers, the few that there are, are exposing the corruption. And people are aware of it. And people are angry. And if SWAPA went to the polls today, they would get obliterated. They got obliterated in November. They got obliterated. They don't control Vintok. They don't control Swakamun. They don't control Luteritz. They don't control any of the cities. They don't control um, um, Rehoboth. They don't control any of them. Their strongholds are even under assault in the northern Ovambo region and other parts in the rural areas. Swapo really has screwed the pooch, and the Namibians see that. And they're tired of 30 years of promises and no delivery. As Early B says, it's, you know, what is, what is, it, uh, what is, what is Early Bass? What's the theory, lyrics in that song? We're tired of excuses. My people need solutions. And that's what's happening in Namibia. Now, will that continue? I don't know. We can't predict that. Uh, and maybe the state will be subverted, the organs of the state to protect SWAPO like the ANC has done. I don't know. But I would say that they're not on the same trajectory at this point in time. And, and I think that's a good thing for Namibians. Hmm. Uh, here's a question for you, Chris, from Sideliner Opinions, who asks, uh, Male coup leader sworn in as interim president, youngest president in Africa. Do you have uh, any news or insights on this story? Oh, that's that's news to me because um, they just forced the president, the interim president, and prime minister to resign when they detained them. They were in custody. So that must have just happened. Uh, I'm not surprised. Uh, Mali has lost support from France. France has suspended bilateral cooperation militarily with this regime. Uh, I, I'm surprised that in Chad that no one's punished 
Chad. Now, they're looking at it very differently because the president wasn't overthrown in a coup. He died, supposedly, in a conflict with rebels when he went out to the front after just being reelected. But unconstitutionally, his son, a two-star general in the forces, was appointed president for 18 months. That's not how the Constitution works in Chad. Uh, but the African Union says, this is okay. Uh, but they encourage the civilians to be involved. <laughs> Uh, but in Mali, um, that's not the situation. So uh, youngest president in Africa, well, you know, lots of Africans are always running around saying we have to turn things over to the youth. Well, good luck with that. Youth and inexperience are not necessarily a good thing. Mm. Uh, Erica says Swapo is having a meltdown. Uh, Neil Pretorius says, uh, hello, Neil. Uh, Neil say, D.O. Mark Sin. So Chris, he's saying you make a lot of sense. <laughs> And then, but what uh, I find what I find hilarious with Afrikaans is you only have one relative article D, and and you know I speak German, so whenever I see D, I mean I'm looking at the feminine. I'm like he called me a girl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Neil has a question. He asked Fra Ur Panduleni Itula in Namibia. So ask about Panduleni Itula in Namibia. Chris, do you have any insights there? Yeah, no, he's uh, he's uh, a dentist, and he's the guy that leads at the uh, Indep Independent Patriots or what is the IPC, I think it is, in Namibia. Fascinating guy. Um, I was trying to get an interview with him when my channel got suspended. I actually interviewed Siska Smith Howard, who is now um, leading the Orongo Council there, the, the region around Swakop Moon, and um, she's the first white woman elected to office uh, in, 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 since it became Namibia. And she's fascinating. I, I, I think I restored that interview on this, on my, well, not this channel, my channel, my new channel, um, for when I interviewed her in December. She is fascinating, full of energy, lots of really exciting person, of course. And of course, she only got elected to office because most of the people who voted for her were black. <laughs> even though she's white. Uh, the IPC is interesting, but then you also have the, uh, the, um, the, uh, what's, there's a couple other groups, the, the mayor of, of Vinto, um, that group, the, the landless people's movement or something like that. They're, they're a bit dicey and that's, you know, that's the problem with the opposition fractured, um, Swapo still has a chance to retain its majority. So people have got to snipe and take more of it away. But the IPC is a fascinating uh, party, a fascinating development. We'll see what happens with it. And and Dr. Uh, the dentist there is is quite an interesting guy. I'm hoping to get him on my channel. Uh, and, and I don't know if you realize this, but a lot of my viewers know that I have a special place in my heart for Namibia. And anytime I can promote it or talk about it, um, I do, despite the attacks by radical black nationalists from the Zambezi district who accuse me of being pro-Botswana and attacking Namibians. <laughs> mm. uh, Chris, here's a very fascinating uh, development. So Neil Pretorius, who is uh, one of my uh, good friends from Stellenbosch uh, back in the day, says he's currently making a documentary about the IPC and he's working with them and he'd like to interview you for his documentary. I'm I'm game. I'm happy to do it. And actually, I'm, if he would like me to help in some way to collaborate some way, I'm I'm happy to do that too. Namibia deserves attention, uh, and not just because um, although it has a very similar history to South Africa, it's uh, it's on a different trajectory. I, I just I, I anything I can do to talk about it, I'm happy to do. So, yep, um, you can put me in touch with him. You've got my contact, and I'm happy to talk to him. And by the way, Neil, go subscribe to my new channel. <laughs> Desperate for subscribers. <laughs> uh, before we continue, everyone, if you're not aware. Chris has a new YouTube channel. The link is in the description after the stream. You can uh, you can go over there. Oh, Nick, there's another super chat. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, Nick Muller has a question, uh, Chris. Uh, he says, Ernst, a question for Colonel Wyatt. Besides the upcoming local elections, is there hope for South Africa? That's what a very big question. They're so late in the stream, but let's uh, let's see if the Colonel can uh, can pull something out of the hat. Yeah, no, the, uh, I, I would say this. Um... South Africans have a chance to change the trajectory with the municipal elections. Now, people are like, well, but that does it does solve some things. First off, this argument that that the ANC will always get its support base, people always vote for it, just doesn't hold up the water. And, and so let me explain. So first off, the ANC has already fractured it twice that we're aware of openly. And they've done it internally and people left the party without making it being seen. But COPE came out of ANC and the ANC lost a chunk of its support. And COPE got 7.5% in the next elections. Of course, they've kind of tapered off now. Then the EFF broke away. You know, the, the angry, naughty children associated with the inconvenient youth of Julius Malema left the party and went with that with that standard. That winds up being another 7 to 9% of, of the ANC's total strength. The ANC continually drops in its vote total in each election. They had only 10.5 million people bothered to vote for them in 2019 in a nationwide election. That's less than they had in 1994 in a country that has 20 million more people 
<laughs> and 12 more, more, more eligible voters than there were in 1994. It shows the ANC is wildly unpopular, uh, but people have to get out and vote. Now, it's not a perfect solution because what happens is that the government, national government, does control budgets for some degree of the budget for provincial uh, governments and local governments, and they have an influence over it. But this base that people talk about, and 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 let's let's just put this in terms that, that some people don't say openly, but what they're talking about is black voters, black voters. Well, there's no such thing as black voters, but rural black South Africans will always vote fancy. That's nonsense. Um, and and it, it, it and the proof in the pudding is we've seen the the Democratic Alliance, for instance, peel off a fair amount of ANC support in Hauteng. You know, the, the DA, despite a feckless, useless, idiotic, idiotic, stupid campaign in 2019 in which Musi Maimani should have done the right thing. And as soon as the results announced, tendered his resignation. If he were a real man, he would have done that. But despite that, they still hived off a lot of the ANC support and they nearly took Tank province. So my point is that you can get voters to not vote for the ANC and vote for your standard and you need to do it. And 2021 is the key. If you take control of the municipalities, then you can show not in a coalition. We've seen the coalition fail in Nelson Mandela Bay because corrupt parties wanted concessions and the DA wouldn't go along with concessions. So the coalition fell apart and the city fell back into the ANC's hands. It's back in DA hands now. But but if you take control of the city, you can show improvement. Now, we can debate about whether the DA has been successful in Cape Town. That's an, a fair argument. But in Nelson Mandela Bay, any objective observer will look that in the time that Alfred Trollope and the DA controlled that city, streets were cleaner, refuse was picked up, parks were mowed, things were clean, services were delivered delivered and the city improved day by day, got better and better. Um, now, if any political party can do that in a small town or they can do that in Schwana or they can do that in Joburg and Durban and Bloemfontein by taking power from the ANC, then you will prove to voters who are skeptical that you care about South Africans, whether you are the Nkata Freedom Party, you're the UDM, you're the African Christian Democratic Party, which doesn't stand a snowball's chance in hell of taking any towns. But but um, the Freedom Front Plus could probably take some towns in the Northern Cape, in the Karoo, the, the IFP could take some towns in KZN, and the DA could take the major metros without a coalition. And then you prove to voters that you're honest. And when you find corruption, you stamp it out and you send them pack and you make a public spectacle of any transgressors, unlike the ANC, and you can compare your actions to ANC. So I think that there's hope. But if the ANC retains a majority in the metros in the municipal elections 2021, my, my optimism for South Africa will diminish greatly. And I will be looking at a country in which the twilight hour is approaching. Hmm. Well, uh, Chris, the super chats are rolling in really thank you very much guys I, like i said uh, i hope uh, i reach enough this month so youtube actually pays me out or pays the money because uh, that will mean that uh, uh, this money isn't just going to youtube but uh, thank you very much um dark horse 256 gave me i think this currency is the ugandan shilling uh, that's I, correct I that's correct yeah uh yeah very interesting so he he asks uh, any thoughts on adf in eastern drc the updf just redeployed there but it smells fishy to me given that the drc demands uganda 13 billion dollars in reparations chris do you have any information on this Sure. Um, for those who don't know, I was stationed in Uganda and I worked extensively with the Uganda People's Defense Force. I've also worked down in the southwestern part of the country, which is where Museveni is from and where the ADF comes across the border from the Congo frequently. Uh, the ADF has been a thorn in the side of, of the government in Uganda for a long time and their incursions are real. They do come across the border, they do commit crimes, they do commit terrorist acts, and they are a legitimate threat to security for people in the southwestern part of Uganda and also in the Congo. But beyond that, they don't have much reach and they're not a threat to anyone else by and large. Uh, I'm not surprised to see the UPDF go back down there. Uh, Museveni's government can't allow this sort of nonsense to be happening where, where people suffer as victims of this, this depredation. So I think that's why they responded. I mean, you, you, Museveni's got enough distractions right now. His oppression of Bobby Wine, uh, the murder of dozens of innocent civilians at campaign rallies by security forces, including the police and military. It, it's quite um, disturbing. And now we have just open assassination attempts on the streets of Kampala. General Wamala was just, they just tried to assassinate him. I know him personally. I worked with him extensively in Uganda. He's commander of the defense forces when I was there. They tried to kill him. They murdered his daughter and his driver. He was shot in the shoulder and survived. Uh, but um, this brazen daylight riding around on Boda Bodas. Uh, Boda Boda is a scooter. Uh, the reason it's called Boda Boda is it's a, it's a, uh, a bastardization of English. Uh, Boda to Boda was because people used to ride the scooters to go from border to border. 
going from one board to the other. So they call them Boda Boda. And so people riding Boda Bodas and shooting um, a minister of government and a retired general, that's that's off the charts. This is – now, I could be wrong. My experience is an honest man, a legitimate person who was very successful with the police, kept them as honest as possible, successful in the military, and has been a reliable government minister not involved in corruption, and someone tried to assassinate him. There's a lot going on in Uganda, and people need to pay attention to it. The inability of Yovari Museveni to let go and walk away – with the big man complex is very detrimental to the current situation in Uganda and to its future. He is a nearly 10,000 year old fossil who needs to leave. Um, however, half of Uganda's population are under the age of 15 and they have no idea who this fossil is and what his role in life is. It's very disturbing. Hmm. Well, Chris, uh, we could talk for hours. It's, this is uh, it's really fascinating uh, delving into your, your knowledge of the, of the, of the African continent. Uh, but maybe a final question before we start uh, uh, wrapping up, and that would be if you could tell someone, if if you could give someone a suggestion in regards to which con- one country in Africa to keep an eye on for negative or positive reasons, just for interest sake, a country where it's very interesting times, which country would you pick? Oh, well, that's a little different from the question we talked about ahead of time. I thought you just said just to watch, and I was looking from a positive standpoint, and I came up with a list of four countries there. I said Mauritius, Rwanda, Ghana, and Tanzania. Tanzania yeah. is maybe, a uh, yeah, maybe I'll change the question. Give a, a quick uh, summary on each one of those. Yeah, and then I'll tell you the, the one that not must be watched for negative reasons. So Mauritius has long been a popular destination for wealthy, high net wealth individuals who are looking not to get away from Africa, but to get away from places that are problematic. Great banking system, great resorts, uh, healthy economy, a relatively calm society in which people get along. So Mauritius is a fascinating one there. Uh, Rwanda, because its potential for business uh, is an interesting story. Ghana is a very interesting story in West Africa. It's doing quite well, other than the fact it's adding a bunch of debt that I think is in some respects unnecessary. Tanzania, after the death of John Magfuli, who died from COVID a few months back and has been replaced by by, um, the vice president now, she um, looks that, that the country may be changing course. Tanzania has immense potential, lots of mineral wealth, tons of agricultural wealth. It, it could be a tiger. It could be an African tiger. You know, I know there's no tigers in Africa. You know, the Asian tigers. I'm trying to make the comparison. It could be the African lion that roars if Tanzania goes on the right path. It's had a very fractured and difficult history since independence with a path down socialism, which didn't work and was disastrous and led them to p- in poverty for about 30 years. And they finally changed course. Um, and it was a rising star until Magafuli came along and he just became a problematic figure. Now with his death, Tanzania might be an interesting story. As far as the country in Africa that people need to pay attention to, that's South Africa. South Africa's government is bent on racial division. It's bent on preferences, which when apartheid was the law of the land in South Africa, many of us recoiled at the thought that people should be denied access to services and denied rights based on their skin pigmentation. Well, that is South Africa today. The African National Congress passes racial legislation, which discriminates against minorities, in particular white South Africans. It has the absurd position of having a successful black owned company, majority black owned company in South Africa, like Grand Parade, which owns the Burger King franchises, 90 franchises around South Africa. They're loss making. They can't make money. And this is predating the COVID uh, situation before the pandemic. They were losing money. So they look to package it and sell it off and, and walk away with a profit. They bought it in 2012. Now they want to sell it. They originally tried to sell it for 693 million Rand. Then they lowered the price to 593. A U.S. equity company, the Emerging Capital Partner, said, We'll buy it. We have the expertise. We can save Burger King. We can turn it around. We also know Burger King from the States, so we can make it happen. They agreed to sell it. The Competition Commission in South Africa stepped in, a body that ostensibly is supposed to be there to ensure that there's no monopolies and no oligarchs running the economy. And they, they fail miserably at that, by the way. Look at South Africa's banking sector, for example. But they stepped in and said, no, 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 no. Uh, you can't sell this to this company because right now, 60%, 68% of the shares are owned by black South Africans. And when you sell it to this American company, zero will be owned by blacks of any stripe. And so they're going to stop foreign direct investment in a collapsing economy, which would save hundreds, if not thousands of jobs. When you look at the larger ecosphere, suppliers and those who are family members, thousands of jobs and and people supported by it because the investors who aren't even South African don't have sufficient number of people of dark enough pigmentation. This sort of nonsense is what's destroying South Africa, along with so many other things, the corruption, all this other stuff. So- 
Af South Africa, I think, is a country that everyone needs to pay attention to because of what's unfolding there. This expropriation without compensation nonsense in which the state will be allowed to use the power of law to intimidate or to silence political opponents because we can simply threaten to take your retirement funds or your bank accounts or your cars or your jewels or your home if you dare say something about the government of the day, whether it's ANC or someone else. Uh, this is a very chilling thing. And South Africa has a bill before parliament in which you can be in prison because you unintentionally insulted someone. Piss off! Unintentionally insulted. This is bizarre. The world's most liberal constitution is being eviscerated by a political party that's trying to distract everyone from their stealing and their failure. And the world is ignoring it. The world thinks South Africa is April 27th, 1994. Kumbaya, apartheid is over. It's the rainbow nation. Madiba is leading us into the 21st century. Well, he did. We got there. And then Jacob Zuma came along. And things went the other direction. So I would say that the country that people in Africa need, or that people need to pay attention to in Africa right now, without without doubt, is South Africa. Because where South Africa goes, if South Africa falls, and it's already in the collapsing stage right now, but if it falls completely, it's a disaster for Africa. The most advanced financial markets, the most advanced economy, the most advanced uh, tertiary education system, the most capable co country on the continent to just implode is a disaster for Africa. Mm. Well, Chris, that was a, a very fiery ending. I think it's a perfect way to end it. Um, thank you very much for sharing your insights and very deep knowledge on uh, African affairs here on the show tonight. I really appreciate it. And it's, uh, it's really fascinating to listen to you unpack so many countries. I mean, I can't even... Uh, I can't even count the amount of countries that we talked about tonight. I mean, if I just think, uh, try to recall, I think we covered over uh, between uh, a dozen and 20 countries tonight in regards to what's going on there and what the future holds. So thank you very much. That's uh, then you are an invaluable source of information in regards to what's going on on, uh, on the continent. Um, so maybe just uh, before we say goodbye, I want to remind everyone that is, there's a link to Chris's new channel in the description. Go there after the stream, go subscribe. Let's get him to, to uh, 1,000 subscribers and uh, then also go check it out. He is constantly streaming very regularly and he does quality content. He answers your questions in the chat. He's very responsive in regards to his audience. So you'll never have to worry that he's not going to answer your questions. Um, so please go over there, go subscribe uh, and go check out the good content. And then also just thank you again very, very much to uh, all the people that tuned in tonight and especially those that uh, gave their super chats thank you very much it's really very much appreciated it goes towards making this channel better and um, i hope everyone has an excellent night and uh, chris uh, i'll definitely be chatting to you again real soon well thanks a lot answer i really appreciate the opportunity to come on I, I do have this question i suppose when i next come to south africa will i get to be in that really awesome sexy studio that you use to make your prepare videos <laughs> I, I look forward to that but uh, i gotta say um Amongst the content creators in South Africa that I've known for the longest, you were one of the first that I came across, uh, mostly because the the, the, the the moniker is pretty cool, the Conscious Caracal. I actually know what a Caracal is, so it got my attention, mm -hmm. and and I, I enjoyed your content. So it's always a pleasure to be on your channel. You've been on my channel just recently, Ron, there. Thank you for that. Uh, you are a level-headed young man, and I appreciate the work that you do. Uh, with your organization in South Africa, trying to advance civil liberties and civil rights for all South Africans. So God bless you, and thanks a lot for your time. It's good seeing you again. Thanks a lot, Ernst. Mm, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, when you come visit here in South Africa, I will definitely give you a tour of the of the studio, and the, uh, I'll give you a tour of the entire AfriForum uh, offices as well. And I'll show you where we train the snipers as well. <laughs> so uh, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. If you're new to this channel, you can also subscribe uh, for these types of conversations. Uh, I hold I uh, do them regularly. And then also you can leave a like to help out the show. Uh, if you're not watching live, you can leave your thoughts in the comments. I was always appreciate reading those. And lastly, you can also join my Telegram channel where you can be kept up to date on the latest news and uh, uh, the latest streams as they, uh, as they are scheduled. So cheers, guys. Have a good one. And 